All right, so the um, first question um, is, and anyone can take this, so when you start brainstorming about an initial welcome series, what are the pieces that people fail to think about? Well, I think uh, one of the things that uh, we try to incorporate is uh, explain to people the full scope of the work that you do. Sometimes people who are coming out of your file, they found you because they sort of stumbled across a Facebook post about something that's, you know, a crisis that's happening, an emergency that's happening, something that's maybe very uh, discreet compared to like the full scope of your work. So giving people the opportunity to understand the full scope, so that might be a great video that you have that just happens to be embedded on a donation page, or um, a survey that kind of like, it, it's asking people what area of your work they're most interested in by sort of suggesting these are all the things that we work on and just letting them know. Um, so I think like giving people that sort of introduction to what they're going to be receiving from you. Uh, and also showing them the people from your organization are going to be emailing them. So I know that I'm on HRC's list, and there's sort of a common thread of people who email me on a regular basis. And um, so it's nice to familiarize people with who's going to be on that from line when they're uh, getting emails from you. Yeah, I would add to that um, along those similar lines, thinking about the cadence of the welcome series in relation to the cadence of your standard communication. Uh, email communication strategy afterwards, right? Uh, it's very easy to do a generic three-part welcome series, but is that going to be, you know, how many days apart? Um, and that really should groom them to expect the lag time or the wait time between your regular emails. So if you're only emailing a couple times a month, you'd have you should have a different cadence to your welcome series than if you're emailing a couple times a week. Um, so. Don't stretch it out too long, because then people will forget why they signed up in the first place. But keep that in mind when you're thinking through that initial cadence, because you are training them as just like you're introducing them to the voice and all of the other initiatives. You're training them on what you should, they should expect from you. And then I will add as well, even though it's a welcome series and you're welcoming people on to your organization, they're learning a little bit more about your mission and your vision, it's also important to collect data about the supporters or about the donors who are coming onto the list. And so offering them things that they can do to take action, whether it's, like for us, we ask people to join our mobile action network so people, so we collect cell phone data. For people who don't have addresses, we ask for their address so that way we can reach out to them in direct mail. And so just really thinking about data, how you can learn more about those supporters and donors. How do you guys feel about, like, when's the right time to ask for money in a welcome series? So think about a welcome series, that first time someone signed up, you know, when does it shift from being a soft ass to a hard ask? You know, like along that series, you know, is that where you want to end? You know, how are you trying to, when you're thinking about building out that first kind of like communication, you know, how long do you kind of want to wait? So for our, uh, for our supporters, of course, the first two or three emails, it's just basic uh, data collection and welcome into the list. And then once we get past those initial like three emails, and then we go out with the ask um, for them to become members. And we kind of play it up like, oh, this is new member day, or we have a deal for you this week. And so we just try to make it seem like it's really personal and like this is the day that you joined our list and we're reaching out to uh, make that ask. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen success in different ways and I think this is where it comes, automation can really help too because it's thinking about where people are coming in, what is their previous relationship with the organization because just because they're new to your email file doesn't mean they're new to you. So really thinking through that source uh, info and the relationship of the, of the supporter with you is, is important. And I mean, I don't know if Amnesty US uh, is in the room or if they still do this. They, a while back, they were doing their first email as a fundraiser. And it was all about that urgency based, all about you, like the time clock for a 24-hour match deadline started when your record was created. Um, and they did amazingly, right? So, but there's, there's that balances. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, I would say most common is a second or third email. Okay. Um, just to kind of ease people in, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely you should have different welcome series for the way that people are coming in. So if you just have like a generic welcome series, people who just happen to land on your website and fill out the, the newsletter subscription page or something, that's one thing. But if somebody's coming in and because they made a gift, then maybe it's an opportunity to push them up to like being a monthly donor mm -hmm. or ask them to for another gift or, you know. So I just think it's like until you kind of know 
who they are and what their propensity to give. Maybe it's better on a general level because you sort of push it towards the end. Um, and I was going to say that um, in terms of like data collection, I worked on the P to Welcome series, which is intense. I mean, it's like very, very long and very complex. But one of the things they're doing is they're pushing people through an email series that's tied to all the different issues that PETA works on. And then they're trying to find out like which action do you take. So whether it's about like animal testing or farm animals. Mm. Uh, and that way then they can put you into buckets based on what you say you're interested in. So you're going to get different fundraising asks and different advocacy asks based on sort of what actions you took. Which I think is also kind of a, a passive way of collecting information. Right, which actually may end up being more accurate because mm -hmm. people, what they say they're interested in versus what they actually take action on can be very different. Yeah, okay. Especially in a place like, you know, thinking about like PETA, I mean, there are so many different like programs that they might have there. Mm -hmm. That you're like, I'm a PETA, like, everything. Yeah, everything, like, all everything, the animals, everything all the animals. All. But I know like that came up yesterday in Gabby and yours mm -hmm. where, you know, you made people choose, right? They yeah. had to choose like what is their interest. So Gabby works at uh, Humane Society International. And the survey, and what was the choice they had to make? Were you like forced them to make a choice? Yeah, they had to choose which campaign. It said like, we know you care about all animals, we know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you had to choose which campaign, and it forces to select one. You can't check them all. Right? Gotcha. Yeah, it's so something they were like most out. interested in hearing. Yeah, updates. exactly. Because so. I mean, you know, like at some level, like that's where you want to make the appeal pitch to, right? Like that's where you're gonna like, yeah, you can send them all the stuff as well, but you want to make sure that that group is gonna get those pieces of information because that's what they're really interested in. So. Yeah, and then after they fill out the survey, you could send them like a fundraising appeal tied to the issue. Right. Or after they took action on something, you could send them a fundraising appeal tied to that action. Um, so that way, maybe you have a higher. Also, I know that my experience, like a generic welcome series, has a terrible fundraising like level. <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily like pin my hat on that one. Yeah. No, I mean, but recency of action or gift is the most likely indicator of next action or gift. So don't sit on it, right? Once you get that that hand raise of whatever it is, make sure that you're, if, it's, if it can be automated, even better, right? But make sure you have that system set up so that you are following up with them um, quickly. So whether it's joining the mobile community and actually sending them that SMS, so you're translating that action into that next step, um, or the fundraising and stuff. It's so important to just have it quick. Yeah, and then so thinking about that, you know, what are some like day-to-day -day tasks or maybe weekly tasks that can be handled like with a marketing automation? So that way you don't have some development associate who's spending 10 hours a week, like just literally just building an email that they build every week. So what are some places you guys have maybe seen that? So when I first started at HRC, we, had, we have a partners program, which is our monthly giving program. And so every month we would send out emails manually about people who declined or people who went inactive. And so I was the lucky person who had to sit down every month and find time to send out these emails. And so being able to use the marketing automation to be able to target people who have declined, has, you know, it, it does give you more time back in your day. So think about those little, I'll just say, nuance <laughs> things that you do every day what is something that you could automate and turn into a series to make your life easier and you can focus more on the work? Yeah. Oh, question. Yeah. Um, to build off of that, can you, are you currently targeting people before they expire or lapse? And if so, can you talk through how you're making that work on the end? So we actually use WorldPay, and so they have like a credit card processor that reaches out probably like a month before or two months before. And so for us, we also use Roy. And so once it gets into like a D3 or D4 status, that's when like two or three months, then we'll email them uh, in that series. Yes. You can use Ian for this though. They do now have in the marketing automation tool uh, an audience that they've pre-set up for you that says that this person's credit card is about to expire. And then you can send uh, an automation triggered off of that. So it's, it's in there. It's under like the audience and selection. And depending on the payment gateway that you use and kind of how that's structured, you have different options for how then someone can update their credit card. Expiration date. So for instance, um, for those of you that don't know, uh, last year we came up with a module called The Hub. Uh, it's the, the supporter hub and um, not widespread pickup yet. I think maybe in 2019 when I see some more people pick it up. Um, but one of the big things that it can do is you can actually use it if you have a payment gateway that allows this to happen to allow recurring supporters to update their credit card um, expiration date 
So that way they're doing it, you know, and so that way you don't have to like call that. I mean, it may be a good touch point to, you know, call up somebody. Like that, that is a nice soft touch point to call and say, hey, we noticed that your recurring gift is, you know, going to, you know, expire. And I know there can be a lot of um, trepidation around reminding people that they're giving to you on a recurring basis. Um, but for the most part, like engaging with those people and letting them know that you know that they give monthly, in the end, that's only gonna build a better relationship, you know, with that person. You know, if they end up canceling on you, then they probably weren't that interested or they were in a hard spot and they're right. really upset that they had to cancel and they're gonna come back and if you have that phone call with them or that interaction and don't just let that thing die, then that's an opportunity, you know, just to start building that relationship, which can be really important. And, you know, I mean, Drew, I'll be able to talk more about this, but, you know, when it comes to online giving, I feel like, you know, the best kind of nonprofits still think donor-centric mm -hmm. about their online giving, right? I feel like it's something that you guys do really well. You know, I know I'm a monthly giver, you know, to HRC and it feels like, like they know like who I am. I mean, they do know who I am, but like <laughs> that they, that you know, that I'm not just kind of like a number in their system that they're getting my 537, you know, a month from. Like they're actually, you know, like I'm kind of part of that community because there's like some individualness that's coming like through in your guys' emails and things you're doing there. And that's really, I mean, it's not, it's outside of marketing automation, how we kind of build that relationship sure. with people, but we slice and dice our lists <laughs> into a lot of different segments. So yeah. that's how we're able to achieve that. I think you can use automation for some of that stewardship though too. Like people always talk about automation for the onboarding of supporters, but you can use it for stop lapse programs, you know, look at your data, are people falling falling off at the 9 month mark, the 10 month mark, the 13 month mark, whatever it is, you know, most people give annually cuz that's what they do. So if you can stop them ahead of time and break up that pattern through automation, um, that's amazing. And I've seen organizations do a sustainer, like almost like a newsletter, but like a sustainer cultivation on a monthly basis that is automated. And it's going out based on the data that they know about me, especially if they have surveys in place. Um, and it's not the same thank you receipt every single month, but, it's, but it is reminding me that I am a part of their uh, valued community, right? If you're giving $10 a month, $20 a month, you know, to some organizations, like you're approaching mid-level giving. Uh, and you shouldn't be like, don't wake the bear. You should actually be stewarding these people. And that's just one thing, just from the platform side, is that you have options for if people, if they're in a marketing automation, can get additional email appeals or don't have to get them. You can set how many emails someone can receive in a week. So there's, a, there's some flexibility in the platform. By default, we, if you're in a marketing automation, that's it. You're not going to get any of your extra appeals. You're not going to get anything else. But that doesn't have to be the case. You are able to tweak some of those things. But just by default, we make it so that way people only get the one email if they're in a marketing automation campaign. Um, and those options can be ticked on and off. You know, you can, like year ends, I'm ticking everything off. Everyone's getting all my emails, as many as I can send them, unless they gave, in which case I'm going to suppress 30-day donors. But maybe if they give on December 12th, I'm probably going to bug them on December 31st. Yeah. Because, like, why not? You know, they're probably not going to, like, unsubscribe. You, you know what I mean? They're probably just going to ignore me if they already gave in that time. But, you know, those are all the kind of things that, you know, there are options in there. And that's one of the things that, you know, we'll be doing kind of a hands-on marketing automation after this at 1015. And those are the kind of, if you wanted to kind of talk about that with the support team, with me, we can kind of, kind of walk you through kind of how some of those things work. So it's something to kind of keep in mind uh, as we kind of keep going through this. So any other kind of thoughts on... You know, that, that piece of the pie that we were just on? Well, the expiring or suspended gifts process is also an opportunity to maybe somebody who's giving a restricted gift to maybe free them from that restricted gift or switch them to ACH so that you don't have to keep bugging them about the credit card thing. Um, so that could be an email in your process as well. And then maybe if somebody's ending up at the end of the automation, they've done nothing, maybe that's an opportunity to say, like, you know, suggest a lower amount. Um, perhaps they would be more likely to, to recommit if they have less of a commitment. Um, so just as you're thinking about, so kind of shifting over to adoption at an organization, right? So you have people who are used to sending out that partner email like every Friday, right? And they're like, I'm, I'm in control and I know how to do it. <laughs> how do you start to wean people off that and start to get them to understand like how the marketing automation is going to make not only their lives better, but also eventually like be more effective for your organization in terms of raising money or getting more advocacy actions? For me, the number one sell was just time, really. You yeah. know, you're able to get the time back. But also with time, you're also able to collaborate across departments. So I'm able to reach out to the person who manages the partner program. I'm able to work with the data team on what kind of files we need. So that way it does 
give them back time in their day as well so that way they don't have to track how many people have been declined to send an email or we're not bugging the data team every Friday for a list of people who've declined and so it gives everyone time and also some time to collaborate as well. Yeah, that was a big thing we did. So for some of our clients, um, they don't have their offline transaction information in their ECRM, whether it's engaging networks or elsewhere. Um, and so we were getting monthly batch uploads of 30-day donors for sustainer upgrade asks or um, birthday dates in the upcoming month to do invite campaigns for peer-to-peer. You know, it was really just came down to looking at the data and showing them that the people who are responding to these triggered emails, right, that were manually batch uploaded on a monthly basis, were the people who had online histories already. So while multi-channel, and I'm a huge proponent of multi-channel communication and just receiving email, even if people are not taking action through email, does increase lifetime value and retention, like in the end it was that weight of the people who, the time it takes us to get that offline data into the system, manually loaded, all of that fun stuff, there was no return there because those people weren't responding to this need. So that's where we started really with this client, trying to do the, the triggered emails, which saved everybody time, whether they were in the online team or not. Um, and we didn't see a dip depression, and in some areas have seen an increase in adoption or the usage of those emails because we're targeting the right people, not just all of the people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And also, like, if there's things that they've always wanted to do, but they just don't have the time to do it. Like, if you, I've always wanted to send an email to a supporter because they only made one gift and it's been six months and we want to try to recapture them, how do we re-engage them? You can set up an automation to do that. So if they wanted to do things like that, but they just didn't you know, it's hard to find the time. You can set that up and just let it run. You know, these renewals you can just set up and let run. Like, there are so many ways of engaging people that you can just take care of that and then focus on some of your wish list items. And I guess and this may be kind of like a selfish question from my perspective, but, you know, as part of my job is to onboard all the new clients, right? And I really want them to create a marketing automation, like, during onboarding. It's, that's hard. That's hard to convince them, like, why it's worth the, I don't know, three or four hours to kind of think about it and set it up and that kind of stuff. And it's just kind of, you know, how do you kind of break through that? And I guess it's just maybe giving better examples and kind of working at it that way to maybe try and show them, like, why it's worth it to do that thing. You can just start with one email. Maybe that is true. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. And just, like, one, e series. Yeah, like one email is better than nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so can engaging networks be used as your primary CRM? And if so, are you keeping all of that all that information in there about restricted donors, so when you trigger these series, you know, okay, this person may qualify, but we're not gonna email them for a particular reason. You know, when you're automating these emails, is that a consideration? It, it definitely is, and I think you guys can probably speak to engaging networks most specifically, because I know some organizations are using it as their primary CRM. Mm -hmm. It's not something that the system has been really been like marketed in that way, but so especially smaller groups are doing yeah. it. Yeah, so uh, what I would say is we definitely don't position ourselves as a database of record, okay. right? We definitely position ourselves as an ECRM, and it's what you're going to use for your digital engagement. We do have about 10%, I think, of our clients kind of across the board use us as their database of record but they are only doing work digitally, or it is only for their digital work that they are using us for. So they're not upload, they're not collecting offline donations, or if they are, they're not pushing them up into us. Um, they're not keeping track of like major donors. Maybe they don't have like a major donor um, like campaign. They don't do that kind of like work. And they're, this is really just kind of like a focus. Uh, but that is a very small minority. Uh, and I know, um, if Elise was here, she just had her baby, so she's not here with us. Um, but she would tell you as part of the sales cycle, that's a very similar type of thing as well, where we kind of pitch like, we're not your database of record. We want you to use Roy. You know, we want you to go out and use one of these systems that's designed to kind of handle all of that kind of offline database. So I guess you, you may be, as um, part of your criteria that you're using email, um, you might be looking at profiles. So like our major donor may have a different profile than us. That's correct. Yes. So yeah. Yeah, and actually the marketing automation profiles are actually separated from the regular profiles that are built out that kind of handle content management and those kind of things. Um, they run in a different set of jobs, um, and they're just kind of separated that way. It can be a little annoying, I will admit. Like, you're like, oh, I already have it built over here, and I got it built over here. It's just the way the system we decided to structure it that way, so that way 
if this job is running over here, this one can also kind of run, is the idea behind it. Um, but then what a lot of people will do, maybe um, you may be able to talk more about this, is kind of flexing, like using Roy to give someone a flag, and then taking that flag, thanks Eric, and then taking that like flag and pushing it back into Engage Networks to then set up a marketing automation like on that flag. And so you can do kind of a lot of that work if you're like passing values back in. So if you're able to pass values from your offline database of record back into Engage Networks, then you can use a lot of that inherent in your database of record, but over in Engage Networks. Was that helpful? Yes. Okay. I would say something just about the platform. It does allow you to have like add those suppressions. So if you do have those uh, donor profiles or you have those profiles created, you're also able to suppress those. But another good thing about the marketing automation too, so last, a few weeks ago, we had Hurricane Florence. So we were able to suppress people from North Carolina and South Carolina from receiving those emails so we won't sound you know, like tone deaf. Right. But so you can think about ways you can add those suppressions throughout those series where you don't have to actually stop a whole series. You can just suppress a few people through their journey so that way they won't get those emails. And just to talk back, touch back to what Drew was talking about at the very beginning is if you're using that initial kind of welcome series to collect data, on people to get their addresses filled in to get that kind of information, then you're able to do suppressions like that that then help you, you know, not see, you know, so people know like you're paying attention. Mm. You're able to do those suppressions, so they're not seeing those kind of things, right? And so that's where we don't need to go down like a data hygiene kind of rabbit hole. But you know that you I mean that's always going to be. And as someone you know like in your position, you know, at Mercy Home with all the data you deal with, you know, the cleaner your data is, the more you're able to touch people at the right point, kind of along their donor journey, whether it's cultivation or stewardship or whatever you're doing. Which is really at the heart of automation, right? Like we talk about it for ease of use for us, mm -hmm. but like it is about building more donor centric, less blast emails, right? It is about building it so that time makes sense based on your action history, based on your engagement as the individual supporter, which is all about data. <laughs> Ken? The important part to remember is what you brought up before, is trying to find out if they do a lot of offline through the mail. Yeah. You don't want to come out with an email saying, well, thank you for your donation in February. You haven't donated in four months or six months. Yeah. It's like, it's not true. You know, do this much. So trying to find all that offline data, at least from all of it, or keep it or something, because there's a disconnect online and what they generally do through appeals by mail. Yeah. Uh, Ken's comment, in case you couldn't hear, hear it, was about kind of you know, someone can be an online and an offline donor, right? Like Brennan was talking about, you have your multi-channel donors, which is great, but if that offline isn't represented in your eCRM, then you could be bothering people that gave you to you two weeks ago by check, and say, hey, you haven't given in six months. You know, then you just look like you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And as you get to bigger and bigger organizations that have more and more things going on, the donor doesn't care that you have 3.5 million supporter records, like in Engage Networks. Like, they, they, that's what they care about. But they're just going to be like, oh, how do you not know? Like, you're a big organization. How do you not know that I gave to you two weeks ago? Like, that's the thing that they're going to remember. Not like, oh, yeah, you're big, and so you make, like, a, a mistake like that. You know, what they want to know is that you're paying attention, right? And so making sure that you're kind of bringing in offline donations, that way you can build out these market animations so it looks right and it feels good to people. Is really you guys must deal with that. So, yeah, we, we have a team called member services, so they kind of, like, fill their requests if we do, like, have an error in email, and so that's where we're able to kind of, like, uncover some of these issues. Like, we've noticed that some people are actually monthly donors, and they also give to us auto, they also give to us yearly as well, and so you can think how that data can kind of, like, trigger the, and trick the system, so it, we do get a few of those, um, I don't want to say slip-ups, but those few uh, data quirks <laughs> do come over every now and then. Well, and I know two things that we do that one is very easy, including in your copy, something like a PS that literally says, if, our, if you've just sent in your check, thank you so much and, you know, sorry about this email. Like, supporters are very understanding about that. They know that it takes a while for the U.S. Postal Service to send things and to receive them and then they have to get checked cashed and stuff. So if you just actually nuance your copy a little bit to acknowledge the fact that they do have a relationship with you offline and especially during a busy time of year, like that these things just could have passed in the ether, right? Um, or, but also we encourage folks to import some of that offline information into your eCRM so that you can personalize content and automate content based on it. And so you're not going to pull in every single gift, right, with every single appeal code or anything, but we found very useful um, all channel HPC and all channel most recent gift date. 
So you have those two. It doesn't say which channel the gift came through in that specific field, but like you have those two data points that you can work into um, your communication structure. Yeah, and I, you could also import your offline gifts into a donation page in Engaging Networks and have the transaction date and the transaction amount and all that kind of stuff. And so you just have sort of a an empty, a shell donation page. It's called like offline gifts and import people into that. Um, and then you'd have that history without, if you don't have like a sophisticated integration or anything, it's sort of a workaround. That's a great one. Yeah, we see a lot of people do that. Maybe even it's like on a monthly batch. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just monthly just gonna bring over those people. You know, not, doesn't have to be any like a daily type thing, but it's just to kind of keep that data kind of in one spot if you're gonna be talking to those people. Um, all right, so how about just some, maybe Drew, we can start with you, just some successes besides getting time back <laughs> of the marketing and automation you guys have kind of implemented. So if we're just talking about like key performance indicators, uh, we've noticed that the open rates for our, uh, for our welcome series is like three times higher than just a regular email, so it really shows that we're sending people the right email at the right time and responding to the right action, or if it's a donation, or if it's an advocacy action. And then we also saw that we are getting a lot of real current donors, whether it's monthly or whether it's one time a year as well, that almost uh, six times the rate that people are actually able opting into uh, one of those auto renewal or partner uh, giving programs as well. And then as far as um, actions, we recently started asking people like what brought them to HRC? Like are they a part of the LGBTQ community? Are they an ally? Do they just really believe in a full equality for everyone? And so we're able to kind of like target those messages once we have that data on people. And so it's really helped us when it comes to like fundraising or when it comes to like advocacy emails and copy to be able to speak to those people different. And that's just the email that went out. It's like the second email in the welcome series where we're trying to get that data so that way we can speak to them. And so just being able to talk to people and meet them where they are is really part of the success of our program. Question from here. I'm wondering if you treat people so for us we just consider them on a supporter track so they all get kind of like the same email okay. and how do you balance if you have one of the things we deal with is we have We kind of struggle with welcome series versus just giving people opportunity to take action and engage in that quickly. Have you all struggled with that balance? So for us, it's more like the channel. So we go to over like 300 prides. We have like canvas people on the street. And so when we start to notice in those uh, triggers, emails or welcome series, when we start to notice like dips or declines, then we kind of go back and reevaluate that. But always, you know, just like let the data, if you see the open rates are declining, you might need to break out another segment. So for like our monthly donors, um, we have like a partner's uh, welcome series, and then we also have a partner's canvas welcome series, so people who are on the street, so we can talk to them a little bit differently, because we notice those gifts tend to decline more, people tend to counsel from canvas more, so then we just kind of blow out that welcome series into two different tracks for people. Uh, we work with quite a few environmental organizations, and so yeah, you're hitting on all cylinders and sometimes very short deadlines for um, you know, comments on regulations.gov and things like that. Um, what we've done is, as Brandon said earlier, really try and think, have that first message be very specific to the action that they just take, took, um, talk about how that action helps in the overall fight for that specific initiative, but then have the second and third messages broaden out to introduce the broader organization. Um, and actually about a year ago, we worked with uh, Greenpeace to set up an action center on their website so that instead of sending an action alert as part of the welcome series that they need to make sure is fresh and relevant every all year long, they just commit to having that action center up to date. And so the link in the email that's automated is always the same. Um, and it is an encouragement to go visit that action center, bookmark it, visit it regularly, just like blogs or anything else, so that people will get the most up-to-date action alert through their email without it actually being like in the content of the email, which can be really helpful. That's right. Yeah, and uh, in terms of like 
uh, easy wins or successes. Uh, I've done a couple times automations that target supporters who don't have address information in the file. So you need to, if you're an advocacy organization, you need address in the file to be able to divide people into their congressional districts. Um, and so we've done triggers where, where the state is empty or zip code is empty, and then that triggers an automation that asks people to update their profile, you know, share this information with us, or um, you know, fill out this thing and you might get, like uh, if you're one of the people chosen, you might get uh, a bag or something. Um, but they've actually been more successful than I would have expected, and especially if you're asking people, telling them like, we're, we're about to you know, start this new advocacy campaign, but we need to know what congressional district you're in. Please update your profile, and it's just like a very easy form for them to fill out. Um, so something like that. And I also think that if you're doing advocacy and fundraising campaigns, and you know you're gonna send a reminder message to people who didn't take action or donate, and then a social message to people who did, asking them to share it, you might as well just create that in, in a uh, automation. Get all of your content done in advance. You can have all of those interactions and you just turn it on and just let it run. And that way you're not having to remember, okay, I have to pull this list of people who did take action to send them a social message. I have to pull this list of people who didn't take action, send them the reminder. The automation will do all that for you. So you can just sort of set it and forget it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and people will only get it once, too, which I love yeah. in engaged networks. You don't have to worry about people if the campaign is longer or something else happens, that like they're going to get the same message twice, that actually right. won't happen. Yeah, yeah. There are some there's some like nice parameters kind of built in that we can certainly talk a lot more about. Um, we don't have to get into like the technical specifics, but in terms of like you know you can only get a marketing automation once. You know you can't ever get put back into it. Now if you duplicate it and make a copy of it, then that's a new one and you could get dropped into that one. So but you may want that. And so there's a lot. I I will say. From what I have seen from my end of kind of onboarding lots of organizations and talking to them is the number one thing that I see is just like there's a lot you could be doing and that's almost some paralysis there. And that's why I really like your idea, which is like just one, just one email. Because even I, like I tend to push like, oh, build like a three or four and, and that's like a lot of copy for a nonprofit when it's just me sitting there like at my little desk at Engage Networks being like, write for a copy and just that, that's evergreen and perfect, right? Yeah, like, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. like it's really easy for me to sit there and say that, you know, and we all know like, yes, that's a great idea. But yeah, maybe just like going to one, it's just like the, you know, where you introduce the organization and say what you did and thank them and then, then they just kind of go into the normal field. So that'd be good. So yeah. yeah. Uh, Sorry, to go back to the green example, uh, directly to the action center. So then do you, does the action center Yeah, so it's based on, um, it, like, you're, you're obviously looking at your opens and your clicks, and we leverage a lot of the UTM parameters in Google Analytics, too, so we build these custom funnels and goals in Google Analytics so that we can see all of that in one place outside of the ECRM. Um, so you do, because you see where they're taking action, uh, as long as they're not clearing their cookies halfway through, right? Like we're, <laughs> we are able to see that it's like, oh, this welcome series email is what drove this ORCA action uh, for this person or this many people, but then these other people went and did this offshore drilling action. Okay. Yeah. And we use live tracking codes a lot too for our, for our action pages. And so we're always able to tell kind of like where people are coming from or where they took this action. Definitely recommend that. I mean, form drift is real. People don't do exactly what we want them to do. They like get there and then they kind of migrate around. And so having those tracking codes really helps. I like that term, form, form drift. Form drift. Yeah, form drift. Yeah, form drift. yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like scope creep, you know. Yeah. It's like <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and like, you know, just to fill out that just for a second, this is when it does come to tracking codes, that's one of those places where taking time to think about how you're going to name things. Yeah. You know, especially if you're moving to a new ECRM, mm -hmm. uh, or if you've been on the platform for a while but are making some like choices, or you have some restructuring, or any of that kind of thing, that's an opportunity. You know, to say, you know what, we are going to create like every appeal is going to start with dev underscore and like the year and the underscore, and like it can get really kind of like it can become a lot eventually. I mean, some of the ones that I see um, from PETA are like, like 30 characters long. You know, but they have a system that like works and like people know what it means. And that's really important, you know, when you're trying to look at those things and especially when it comes to reporting, when you're seeing just like a Google Analytics, there's just tons of information in there. If you can just quickly read that and you know like how to decode it, yeah. it just makes your life so much easier when you're trying to answer questions or you're trying to report up to C-level people who 
they don't need to know all this, they just kind of want to know the big picture and you're able to pull that a lot more easily. Um, okay, how, um, so Drew, how many, got, how many automations do you guys have right now? So currently we have 12 marketing automations running right now. Okay. And then we're working on getting four more up to be like kind of like not welcome series, but like triggered emails around like partner decline. I'm sorry, partner upgrades nice. or asking people to join like the auto renewal program. Okay. And just what is the, just like at uh, HRC, what's the decision group like that kind of like helps get these from like start to finish? So we uh, work with, of course, on the online strategy team, but we also work with uh, Lotman as well, Lotman Masconeal and Company. Okay. And so we work with them around like consulting, around like strategy and copy. Okay. And so um, we all work together to try to get that up. Okay. And so you tend to find that it's a very, I feel like these are activities that inherently break down silos, kind of like across the board, because you've got to have everybody on the same page. Have you guys found that? I'm not sure how siloed you ever were. I've worked in lots of siloed places, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, it comes to a level of like taste as well. And okay. so like for people on our team, we might think that seven emails, we, at first we did like have seven emails in our welcome series, but this year we decided to cut it down to like three or four, depending on the track that people are on. And so those kind of conversations do happen where do we really need seven emails and trying to convince someone that sometimes, you know, three or four emails is better. So those, we do have the opportunity to have those conversations and things like that, like taste around, should this email be more graphic than more copy or text? And so there's still like decision points that you have to make even once you get them up. Um, and then just kind of like for the group. So we've talked a lot about like converting supporters, welcoming donors, <coughs> credit card expiry, birthdays, what are some other uses that you could see for marketing automation that could kind of be useful for people? So, I mean, it's it is still all about that next action, right, and furthering the relationship. But I'm a big fan of acknowledgement series. Everybody just relies on that one autoresponder from whatever it is that you did, but nobody has ever said you thank me too much. Stop. <laughs> um, so, like thinking about. And again, if you could start with one email, like make that autoresponder really good. It is like one of the most highly read pieces of real estate in an inbox because people want to make sure it went through, especially if it's a donation. But you can build out further than that. You can, you can trigger you know, other types of thank yous that can then also include upgrades or next action asks and things like that. So the kind of like stewardship-esque pieces, I think, get forgotten for automation a lot because it is more of that slow drip. Um, but that's, I think, the next like, area that I would love folks to spend more time on. Yeah, I guess now everybody in this room who does fundraising is thinking about end of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would love to see somebody for those donors who are, for those supporters who have never donated or maybe just like the kind of people you feel like you're spending a lot of time on with very little return on investment. Maybe just automate the entire experience for those people and just say, on Giving Tuesday, we're going to start this and it's just going to run all the way to January 1st. And it's just every week we're going to send them a fundraising appeal. If they donate, they come off the automation. Just for those people who have not given in the last 12 months, so there's very low possibility that they're going to go give again, take them off your list and focus on the people who you think are higher propensity to give and test with them and do all the things that you know you need to be doing. Um, something like that, maybe give it a try. Let me know how it does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the, probably for, by Giving Tuesday in an ideal world, but you probably have an idea of like what your year end is going to look like. Definitely, mm -hmm. yeah. You probably know what the copy is probably going to look like. Like you're you're probably already there, and it would literally just be taking that moment, just be like, and we're going to take the three hours to build this out. You're going to maybe run it by my team to make sure it looks good, in case you're wondering. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you're gonna and then you're gonna click go, and then it's just there. I, like, I really like that. Nice. That's really yeah, a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've been doing a lot of list cleaning on our list, and so we kind of got this idea uh, from the Hillary Rodham Clinton campaign where she would email people who haven't opened an email probably within like a few a month or two. But for us, we've, we've been going back to try to not email people so much who haven't been interactive because that hurts our deliverability, our spam, bounce rate. And so I would like for us to be able to put together a series where we're just targeting probably like every six months people who haven't opened an email mm -hmm. to try to get them back into the fold more regularly. Mm -hmm. And then next step, like maybe like 5.0 for us is actually trying to get a welcome series for our mobile program as well. 
And so I know it's not engaging networks, but you know, being able to, um, if we have people's cell phone numbers and they are new to the mobile list, being able to welcome them a lot faster than having to send out a broadcast about advocacy action. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah do that. Yeah, do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Molly? If you have an evergreen peer-to-peer -peer program and you have a site running, yeah. you sure. should set up a marketing automation on whether they logged in um, and checked the page. They might have mm -hmm. come and created their own giving page for a specific um, event in their life or something, and you know, months have gone by, they haven't logged in, you can set up automations on them. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Even like hey, and, you, and, and as well as you want to speak to donors of your peer to peer differently. Um, right. Than your fundraiser. As well, because they were brought by a person, yeah. not necessarily by your cause. Awesome. Yeah, Rachel. <laughs> um, you, Ben, can probably answer this, but in terms of like the year end idea of taking out kind of like your people who are less likely to engage with you, mm -hmm. how what um like kind of stop gaps do you guys have in place so that it doesn't hurt your deliverability? Like a smaller email file, these messages who haven't been super responsive. Sure. So, I mean, without getting like too much into it, essentially, you know, most of our clients are on shared IPs, right? So, one little thing you do probably isn't gonna like tank a whole bunch of stuff. I would definitely say before I was gonna do something like that, I would definitely probably get rid of like any kind of suppressions or anything like that, like in my system. I might go through and flag people that, you know, you know, Drew was talking about people in the under 12 month range. I might not include the 11s in that because that could potentially really hurt. Uh, if you're not, sorry, I shouldn't. So in Engage Networks, we have an email engagement score. So people that have a score of 11 are people that haven't interacted with an email in more than 12 months, right? And so those people, yeah, there might actually be a lot of like honey pots and spam trap emails by that point that are in that 11. And you kind of want to address that in a different way. And so just mass emailing all those people. So I may suppress 11s, but I may want to talk to people that in the last six months haven't done something, in the last nine months haven't done something. You can kind of use the email engagement scores to kind of help you out with that. That's your zeros? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, bet, you definitely want your zeros. Yeah, yeah I would definitely, zero. yeah. The zeros are the people who um, are newer than 12 months, but haven't done something yet. Right. And those would be the people that I'd definitely be trying to target, target in that kind of thing. Where you signed up within the last like, you know, you signed up six months ago. Like, why haven't you done something? Like, why, why haven't we said the right thing? So, um, but yeah, that was a great question. Thanks for that, Rachel. Um, but anytime you have questions about email deliverability, that kind of stuff, you can definitely also direct that towards my team as well. We have somebody who specializes in that. Uh, his name's Gwyn, he's out of the UK. He can walk you through kind of deliverability. He can kind of show you kind of how things are going for you in particular on your IPs and all that kind of work. And that's all stuff that we kind of have available for you as well. Um, you know, if you're interested, you can just reach out to me or the support team for that. Uh, Ken? Is that you're correct that it's only in one automation at a time? So that's the default in our system, but you can make adjustments based on what works for your account, but it is an account-wide setting. So you can turn that option on and off, and then you have options for how many emails someone can get in a week, and so there's some balancing that you can do there to kind of, kind of do that kind of work. But by default, everyone's account is set that if they're in one marketing automation, they're not gonna get any other marketing automations, and they're actually not gonna get any other email campaigns you're sending out either. Yes. Right. Also in Oh, gotcha. Yes. For those non-openers, I'll throw this out. How would you recommend that you attempt to re-engage them? Are you just starting over your welcome series? Are you sending them, hey, we miss you, or are you just throwing them the, you know, the newsletter at the point in time when you attempt to reach out to them? So for us, people love to tell you about themselves, and so we're like, oh, we haven't heard from you, or you haven't opened. We're explicit, you know, you haven't opened an email in a while, and we haven't heard from you. But could you also, like, confirm, like, this address is correct? So whatever address we have on file, or we'll try to send you a free sticker. Like, just try to entice them to do some kind of action and not just kind of, like, scold them. Like, oh, you're bad. You haven't opened our emails. <laughs> But you know, we haven't heard from you in a while. We want to be able to send you this important information. Is this information up to date? And people typically respond a lot to those update your information emails because it's, yeah. it's more personal. Right. And I think finding this world, this is a place where like um, split testing your subject line mm -hmm. and find out like what, what is getting these particular group of people mm -hmm. to click open. 
You know, is it, we haven't heard from you, or, oh, we really miss you, right? Those are two different things. They're like, hey, open this email, right? There's all sorts of little things you can be doing to kind of see, like, what works for your particular organization. Like, what, you know, for Mercy Home, what is going to bring those people, like, kind of back into the fold? And it's going to be different than what HRC finds, you know, and what CSPI finds, right? It's always going to be a little different, but there are best practices that you can kind of try and see, like, what other people have done and see what works. Yeah, Stephanie? Yeah, I was going to... up here. We'll probably have time if there is one more question from the audience. Or if anybody up here had a comment they wanted to make as we kind of close. Yes. Sorry, so since you brought up SMS, I was just wondering if you sign up for Gmail, if you can go to a different system. Like, what is that going to look like? Because I'm sure it's going to be different. Uh, so the question was utilizing email to benefit SMS, and I'll kind of pivot over here. Could you ask just ask the question one more time? I'm not fully understanding the question. So I guess you know, uh, asking people to sign up for email is a lot easier than asking people to sign up for SMS, which is like a lot more people don't necessarily give their phone number out. So do you use email at all to benefit SMS? To grow the SMS opt-ins. Thank you. Yes. So yes, <laughs> uh, in our welcome series, we have people text in um, to our short code three zero six four four. Uh, a word to get a discount to our HRC shop. And so that's for us to able to grow our mobile action network. Or we ask people, you know, the elections are coming up, we want to be able to target you and get you the right information to get you to Don't the polls. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, it kind of threw me off. But yeah, <laughs> we, um, we do use email to try to get people on our list. Um, recently, like with some of the SCOTUS actions, mm -hmm. you know, we were like, oh, we want to update you on what's happening. Be the first to know yeah. about the nominee, blah, 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 can join our network. And so we do have those kind of emails as well. And that would actually make a good trigger yep. series as well if you have that data capability to know if this number is in your mobile, is in your, if you have this mobile number on people sure. to kind of get that. That could be a good yep. one too. And just to kind of like close here and pit off like what Drew said, you know, the, you know, he was just moving back and forth between what could be a marketing automation and then what's like an email campaign there, right? Like the SCOTUS stuff, timely, you know, on point, you know, probably needs to be signed as an email campaign. But, you know, grabbing someone's phone number and giving them a 15% discount to the HRC store, that could be a marketing automation. Like that could just that's be, yeah. that is an automation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's like how those things can like be set up, so. All right, well, I just wanted to thank the panel. Thanks for showing up today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.